did you notice how, for example, Branko mentioned in the email, I really appreciate how you record some of the conversations. It's true. There's, there's a small cadre, like a small bunch of people on YouTube that actually care about this kind of converse, conversation. But, okay, here's a very oh, yeah. important point. So I mentioned, and I'll repeat this because this is important. So 12 printers I can make in a single day, a kit, about 8 to 10 hour day, long day, optimized production. Yeah. Second day, I package them and ship them. Third day, I do customer support. It's not marketing, it's customer support. So three days. That comes out to four printers per day. Now, here's the, here's the numbers. If you look at Prusa, they make 8,000 printers yeah. per day. But with 250 employees, that turns out to be about a printer per day. Lulzbot wow. does about 1,000 printers. I'm not, maybe off on that. It's about 1,000 with about 150 people. And they, they do about one printer every three days per wow. employee, wow. per person. So per person, number of printers per day. I'm saying a single owner operator in the OSE model can do four per day, which means that we can spend, like I was thinking, you can do, have like three production runs. So nine days out of the month, you do that and the rest you contribute yeah. to R&D. So, so majority of the time yeah, is R&D. That, that makes sense. That's the model I'm trying to develop. I think that's very reachable, especially with this idea of the collaborative contest. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do right now is develop the network around the world of uh, schools interested in doing this exact model. So, yeah. for example, we can now that we've introduced the idea, there's going to be a return of the School of the Nations to our school in July. So maybe we can try building the printer with them this time, the nice. OSD printer. Okay. But maybe even with the new extruder, the new extruder is coming along. Yeah. Uh, I think it's almost fully open now. Wow. The, that would uh, be awesome. So now that would be. The, uh, more work, yeah. So this week, I'm hoping to plan or to to print out the uh, free CAD draft one parts, test them against the actual ones, make modifications, and then lock them into a, a reasonable configuration, and CAD the remaining few parts that have been in CAD yet. What's your plan for the aluminum block? Uh, uh, in the directory yesterday. Sorry, what is your so plan for the aluminum block? The, I, I put it up in the directory, the shared directory of the open source 3D printer printer head. Is the idea uh, to yesterday? So the same. Is the idea that we basically uh, take that, cut it, and drill it, and tap it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've tapped stuff before. Uh, I just it would be interesting to find out what the grade of aluminum is because it's a nice feeling great of aluminum i'm not sure where they get that if it's from the polishing but anyway um it, it will work easily with pretty much any piece of aluminum i'm sure but maybe there's a reason they have that particular grade of aluminum i'm not sure about that one okay so we have a local metal parts shop so if we can find out what grade of aluminum they're working or if that's important at all then we can definitely get those parts sourced and we just yeah. get a whole block of it and huge amounts off and we could produce them at our shop, I'm sure. Yeah, and there's yeah, one. Just as much. I don't know if you care about this, but zinc aluminum alloys. Have you heard of that? Oh, yeah. Yes. So maybe that's what it is, because it looks like an aluminum block, but maybe it's not, or maybe it is. Maybe it's one of these alloys. Yeah. So well, the point is that yeah. this alloy melts right. This is called stove stovetop foundry. So the mm. if you do zinc with about 20, I mean, it's like 28% aluminum, but zinc is pennies. It melts at 420 C, hmm. 420. And then yes, aluminum are. dissolves in it. It's not a melt, it's a dissolution like sugar and water. And then um, the, and the melting point of that is about 500, no, let's see, I think 700 Fahrenheit, so about 500 C. And basically, you can melt that mm. on a, you know, stove top. That's actually interesting. I was looking at that because I was thinking, okay, how do you get these? Because I was thinking about all this casting stuff, like induction furnace. But it turns out you don't need an induction furnace at all at this mm. level. Now, induction, of course, you can do it with heat, but this is a very clean heat. It's right on your stove top. You don't have to mess with it. An electric, an electric hot plate. 
So we can even do that. We can take pennies, American pennies, and put in some aluminum cans for recycling. I was actually looking into that. I saw this guy who was making compressed uh, aluminum bales from cans. Our, our brick press would actually be perfect for that with different code. Wow. I mean, you can make these oh, nice yeah. cubes of aluminum cans, which which you could then melt That's and reuse. So actually, that that part of ecology stuff. is pretty interesting. Nice. Yeah. Nice recy recycling. Wow. Yeah. So, I was thinking, like, yeah, yeah, you know, what's the direction that we take in terms of strategy? But I think it would be, and I, I published this on. Uh, if you go to the wiki, um, you could go to recent wiki changes. And OSC 3D printer strategy, business, uh, let's see, it's called 3D printer marketing strategy or business development strategy. Uh, I would say it's scalability, modularity, and materials. So scalability means we can go larger, which also means the extruder, the filament maker, so we can actually make affordable large prints. Modularity, we can... We can you know, do like the CNC mill to, to mill, for example, the the extruders. Like if we go to the more complicated ones that are more like the Titan Arrow. So there's a, you know, there's a little nice. brief there about that. Uh, and materials gets into the idea that we're actually doing formulations. Uh, one thing I looked into, I asked Dr. Pierce about this, this one. You know how they have how they have metal injection molding. You know what that yes. is. Yes. They use yeah, that's in manufacturing. Yeah, what they do is uh, pellets of uh, polypropylene with metal, and nice. they put that into a mold that melts and flows and mm. goes into a mold. Well, what if we make three D printing filament out of that? Now nice. it's polypropylene. So for that, you need the high temperature printing chamber if you're going to print with propylene polypropylene but um, I guess it would require some development but but this this stuff about materials is that the clubs and the small scale R&D of thousands of students could be testing out all this stuff this is basically like filament composing you know science fair par excellence because it's all tied together in one big project yeah. Yeah. it's not just oh I made a volcano it's, you know, we're part of yeah. a massive network of people who are cooperating to make meaningful technologies. So that's some, one of the challenges communicating these ideas with people. I've struggled with this since we were talking in November. How do we communicate what we're trying to do? Because some people uh, like you and other people we've been speaking with, it's very easy to speak with them. Like we talked to Pascal, he gets that right away. But if you talk to just other people off the street, it's really difficult to get the sound bite that summarizes everything we're doing without going into a lengthy exposition that could take like two hours. <laughs> so yeah. I'm trying to find the ways to talk about this. And just seeking different ways to communicate this succinctly and yet clearly enough that it grabs people's attention. Yeah. So we're, we're, uh, we're working on uh, some materials that will go along with what we're doing with the 3D printer and the OSE collaborative contest so that we can communicate what we want to do so that we somehow have this vision of it's a unity in diversity of projects. So uh, when I thought about it, like we don't want a thousand people doing the clutch of the cordless drill. Yeah. We want two or three groups doing the clutch, two or three groups doing the handle some of them doing the gearbox and so on yeah so maybe some groups will put it all together and make a cordless drill but the one that did the clutch is just as important as one that put it all together so somehow creating that structure a unity and diversity it's a framework and it recognizes who have really contributed but it it also acknowledges that every single contribution is essential for the whole process yeah so yeah. that been one of the toughest things about how to come up with now a set of contest rules that doesn't pigeonhole people into a very particular way of behaving well i think coming so, up with the rules isn't that hard the hard part is getting the people to show up i think because 
the key yeah. to what you said, the unity and diversity is the diversity part, which is the number of people, you know? Yeah. So I think, like, as far as the collaboration ecology, right, we can come up with a pretty elaborate collaboration ecology of all kinds of meaningful roles, but the question is, can we have yes. people to fill them? But uh, my, uh, my interactions with people in the last three months have suggested yes. Yeah. And there are several avenues that this has happened. Through our STEM camps, there was great interest conversation. I'm very interested. Just today, we're making a plan with one of our FRC teams, uh, our sister teams to well in Toronto, in the next competition to be communicating about this exact project. They're very excited about this project. Which one? And then through our sister schools. Cordless, cordless drill? Uh, the, I talked to them about the general idea of the OSE collaborative contest and the cordless drill. But uh, in the last few weeks, I've been gravitating towards, okay, well, if we wanted like a thousand schools to be participating, we need a thousand schools who really have the capabilities to do that. So why not support them now to begin with a 3D printer build, just like you've been doing? And so we start that as step one, that each school gets into it by building a 3D printer. Then we have at least a base level of capability among some students and the teacher to move yeah. forward uh, to do things like that. Then we, and we're talking about that with the 3D printer. It's not only the 3D printer, it's how do we do CAD? How yeah. do we design something and then build the printer and configure it? Like there's a whole set of little uh, lessons that go along with it. Yeah, it's not too onerous. It's reasonable, and it gets people onboarded. So you can picture a three-day workshop like we did. It includes the CAD, and it includes building the printer, but it may also include some design considerations or something like that. So then we get each school on board, and then we say, okay, now participate in this network, this global network of collaboration. And another thing that comes up is, well, what is the collaboration forum? And so how can we streamline what we have with the wiki and with Google Slides and with some kind of forum to showcase, share, and efficiently get all the information through the network? But again, I guess you're, you're right. We just have to get to a critical mass of people before we're even talking about diversity. We can't right. have two groups. So. Yeah. And all in your thing that comes up. So, I think there's a few more updates that are very interesting. Uh, the vice president of a local factory came uh, on his own initiative to visit us on Friday. We're doing with the 3D printer. He wants to build an OSA 3D printer for his factory. He wants to build a one by one by one meter such printer. He also nice. wants to philanthropically support the process of making such printers available throughout the world to schools that may not have the means to do that. Wow. And that's their corporate social uh, responsibility. He's the vice president. He wants to uh, get back to me very soon about the company's commitment to such a process. Tomorrow, I'm also speaking to the head of our school in Shen no, not in Shenzhen, in Los Angeles, who wants to start a STEM program at their school. And they don't have a STEM teacher yet, and so, of course, that's what I'm going to be talking about, uh, the OSC process that we started on. So nice. they may be looking for extra support. So we're, we're getting traction through various people. The Nanjing students are ready to go. Guyana is coming back in July. Our Shenzhen uh, school is ready to collaborate with us. It's just the case of having some concrete sort of time limited sort of thing to get people going. So I'm thinking, let's get 3D printers into the hands of these schools. Yeah. And then, of course, there's Branko. He's over in Netherlands. Maybe we could get him a 3D printer, do a 3D printer build with him. He can start recruiting students on his weekends and even start the process of education before he jumps into the schools because it sounds like there's a little bit of jumping through hoops to get to a school for him. Which would give him an advantage. So, yeah. But there we go with a, a bunch of updates. And it's because with a very small sample, we have a high uptake, at least... Uh, in terms of return customers and people actually physically visiting our facility, asking for more information. There's a lot of uh, promise in what's going on. It's, Did the guy who uh, wants the one cubic meter printer, is he, the, did you know him or he just came? Yeah. No, well, 
I didn't know him very well. Uh, his wife used to be a co-worker at my previous school. She knew some of the Guyanese students who came. We went to their house. And when I was talking to you, I was at his house. Yeah. Uh, the last time we spoke. And yeah. He, uh, he found out what we're doing and wanted to come and see the STEM program. He showed up. And that's when we start talking about, well, they're interested is in... They're interested in manufacturing capabilities at their factory and sometimes they have to print off a significant part and they don't want to spend time or money to do it a 3d printer would be ideal in some cases yeah and they're talking not a small one a big one yeah so i think he's going to be happy to start with a small one that we have and very quickly move up to getting a big one so i told yeah. him i'd be telling you about this. So, nice uh, yes well, sample size and the high rate of interest <laughs> even action with respect to this book. What do we do about the, the so, collaborative uh, contest for April? How how do you feel about that? I think uh, first iteration after everything that we've done is to take all the schools with which we've been in contact and somehow support them to get a 3D printer. So maybe it might be uh, suggested to have like one thing I could suggest, uh, like since it's in the USA, maybe we could uh, suggest meeting in California. <laughs> so go to California. California. And printer builder. I don't know. Yeah. And then that would be the process of actually training a teacher in California. So through the process, we learn about training teachers. Maybe the same may happen with uh, our friends in Netherlands. And maybe the same will happen in Montreal. We could suggest that we visit there and we do some kickstarting and train people to train up other schools and we can network with people that's... Uh, so migrate from the first uh, drill to refocus around the 3D printer? Yeah, I think that's one of the prerequisites because for us, it's easy to start thinking about the drill, but we can do that because we have 3D printers that work and we know how to use them. But yeah. if you talk about that with anything else, they don't know how to use the 3D printer and they don't have one more or less. Or if they have one, they don't know how to use it or don't appreciate its underlying structure. So they haven't built up a commitment to the process of knowing how your own stuff is built, which is part of the open source ecology approach. Yeah. So it seems like a natural way. You get initiated into the process, you build commitment, and you learn appreciation for it by building your own 3D printer. And I yeah. found it's always been a successful kind of activity. My students just today got two other 3D printers working. The ones we had purchased back in September, they've been gradually working on them. So two of them in one day started working. Wow. Are you using ours, the OSC printer? Uh, I haven't used that yet. We're up to four because my university students has been uh, completely uh, learning about it. And so he's been using it as part of his project. So we haven't used that yet, but we will be. Oh, yeah? Very soon. Tell me more about that. So my university students come regularly to the school, and one is really crazy about 3D printing. And so he saw the OSC 3D printer. He wants to learn all about it. He uh, took it apart to see how it was built. He put it back together. He tightened up the belts. He learned everything about it online, and he's pretty much ready to start printing. So wow. I haven't actually, because of the build season, I really hadn't touched that printer. I hadn't done much extra until the other day, well, three, four, or five days ago when I started putting the uh, okay. extruder on me. I hadn't been doing much. So, uh, yeah, I think a, a lot of things will be coming up soon uh, with our 3D printing. So it seems that for the OSC Collaborative Contest, uh, Iteration Zero means getting 3D printers in the hands of people and getting them to know what that is all about by having them build and configure and use. Yeah, I like it. And I think it would also help me because uh, uh, there are, for the OSC 3D printer, I would really like to know inside out all the idiosyncrasies and the settings and all of that. Yeah. And I have your files. I just haven't applied them yet. Yeah. That does make a lot of sense because them. we can create a whole program around the 3D printer. And of course, as I said, with scalability and modularity, so you start putting different heads on it. And then the recursion part right so yeah. as we said in um in a low cost bill of materials experiments okay printing your belts printing your sprockets and everything else 
and getting creative, including milling like the extruder and getting into the machining that does that, literally talking about a uh, Swiss CNC lathe, Swiss screw machine kind of deal, you know. You can build that around the universal axis. So I was kind of designing that a little bit today. Um, but yeah, basically think about you've got the recursion going down to the metal, which is steel. So, I mean, we're going to have to do steel at some point. But I was formulating around the idea of we, we have to gain the capacity to cast or pour three-inch billet, billet or ingot. And this is steel, 200 pounds. Mm. This is your village scale uh, wow. operation that's that beats industrial productivity on a small scale. So then you could use that. So that's a three inch, three inch. Or so you go on scrap, you go to three inch. Now on a screw machine, you can you can machine that down to precision parts. You can take that further into rolling, uh, steel rolling. So you, you can make your steel profiles like for the you know for the frame of the printer or for frames of tractors. Mm. So. At the end of the day, you've got this process, all integrated, uh, 200 kilowatt induction furnace, which is pretty heavy. Mm. Yeah, it's heavy duty. But then you're building a tractor like our our tractor that right now costs like 7,000 or 8,000 in materials for the full size tractor. You're building that for like $300 of electricity cost. Mm -hmm. you know? And wow. you're printing rubber. And you're making metal. Mm. So that's where the idea of, um, of getting to the hydraulics, like, you know, you can scale prototype hydraulics in plastic. But then once you wow. get the MIG casting, uh, like nice. the metal printing stuff or the precision lathing, like the screw machine, you're talking about engines. And then Arduino controlled electronic ignition timing, if you talk about an electron... Uh, either a steam engine or an com internal combustion engine. You can time it with Arduino. So you go pop, pop, you nice. open up the valves with Arduino. Um, but, you know, you have this whole ecology, so we can spin many stories around it. But, you know, to develop that kind of thing, on one side, I'm going to write that in, a in my book about that, okay, what does it take to do that? But I'm, in that process, I'm also going to try to see who's going to be crazy enough to fund this, because it could be could be the seed of, um, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, in rough calculations, it's like a $1.5 million project, a couple of million dollar project to get that to the capacity that you can build a fully working tractor from scrap for $500. It's going to cost about $2 nice. million, um, <laughs> roughly speaking. Once so, you've got that $2 million, then the next... The next several projects are rather less expensive. Well, yeah, and the, the idea that the whole microfactory, including the whole off-grid, you know, 200 kilowatt solar, no, not 200 kilowatt, it would be like 50 kilowatt, uh, but the price ticket of that would be like 100K for this fully equipped open source microfactory, you know. Mm. So that's the goal, kind of, roughly speaking, 100K microfactory, uh, where you can produce anything. You can produce your, your tractors and cars for from scrap, literally, from melting resources. Yes. Um, so you got plastic, you got metal, you got ceramic. Those are the main things. Yeah, we got to be able to process I remember that. you had mentioned uh, aluminum from clay. Yeah. How far was that? I think I asked you about that, but I don't know if that was ever developed by anyone anywhere. I just remember that was one uh, of the most there's, exciting. On YouTube, you can actually see a guy making some aluminum from clay. Um, now, that's a hard thing. So it's kind of like the last the last machine that I would want to do in the system. Because right now, you can easily get that from aluminum scrap, like cans and stuff like that. Like I mentioned about compressing yeah, yeah. aluminum bales. That's an abundant feedstock that's available through the waste stream. But to yes. show that you can do it from clay, that is quite exotic and, and nice. And it's, it also falls into this idea of the materials. Like you have this materials pr processing capacity. So, for example, you take acetic acid or acetic anhydride and you put, pour that on wood and you got cellulose acetate, which is a thermoplastic. You know, so we got to get to some wow. examples where we're doing like crazy stuff with common feedstocks. You're getting exotic uh, products. 
where, you know, a very simple one is oxyhydrogen for the oxyhydrogen torch. You know, you got water and you got this amazing cutting gas. You got the oxyhydrogen generator. But we have to show like a little bit of this chemistry happening, and that's where with the 3D printing, with the material, with the filament composing, I came up with this word filament composing. It's like making music. Now, We're going to be composing filament yes. formulas, right? Some of them could be yes. for, for and there's metal so many printing. Of them, like, yeah. There's a the uh, resin, the liquid resin filament seems to be very promising. In terms uh, of the metal speed. injection molding thing, where you can convert that oh, yeah, to that. filaments. Um, I think there's potential there because that's an already worked out pellet formula. If we want to do pellets, like a, a pellet extruder, we can print that right now hmm. there's a company actually that does that i saw this i was looking at i was looking up metal injection molding and this company that does 3d printing with that with the metal injection molding pellets and they use uh, the pellets directly so they're not making filament out of that <laughs> yeah but yes. that'll be like one interesting avenue so so you see like there's i mean this is a great project for a school you know like get these thousands of schools doing all this and releasing all this innovation into the open so yeah I yes mean, this thing gets me like yeah there's all these great ideas but everything is just locked up you know yeah, innovation is at a standstill right now in general generally speaking yeah and everyone has kind of reduced in their potential as a as a as the result so that's where we are in society but say so again that would be something yeah it's a strange phenomenon because uh, it's undeniable how much the software world has revolutionized our world yeah so yeah. one would have expected the hardware world to start to accelerate appreciably by this point oh, but there's something that's... about hardware that rubber meets the road kind of stuff that kind of gets it stalled in the pipe yeah process. i think you know, one, I think it's it's highly psychological, I think. For one, it's too tangible. It's like it's so real to people's livelihoods that people just shut yes. off, you know. Whereas yes. with software, it's like, it's, oh, yeah, um, great. But, but uh, another thing is with students, people don't immediately see that. Because if we're addressing, like, professionals, like, if you tell some of these things to the engineers. Yeah their shut-off mechanisms are different. Like, oh, that's not safe, or that's not according to standard, or that's not how we do it in the industry or ABC. But students will never say that. Students yeah. are open and they're ready to try stuff. As long as we're presenting stuff that's reasonably safe and we're going to be using, like, plasma in the classroom and <laughs> throwing it around, or right, it, it should be funny. So. <laughs> no, it would be, and it's uh, interesting. So, yeah, you don't get into the resistances because they haven't been formed yet, you know. That's why we got to catch the students exactly. at this point. That's why they need to be trained. People yeah. have to be trained not to be shut down <laughs> because society is exactly. really done. So actually, that's where uh, I would love to read, write a book, how what we call the education system is actually a training system. And by the strict definition of education, we don't have education happening in 99% of schools. It's actually a training program because education requires agency is connecting with the community it requires so many things that are being done in the open source ecology realm but they are not happening in the classroom and I, I think uh, that's part of it training people not to shut their minds so tell me the definition of education well by the which definition most of education people don't get it word. as far as i recall from latin education means to bring forth from and it implies a certain agency meaning that the uh, student has a say as to what's going to be studied in the curriculum and the community has a say as to what's going to be studied in the curriculum as it stands now in ontario for example someone in toronto knows best no matter where you live in ontario if you live in a small northern town well whatever the people in toronto say well that's what you're going to study well that's not education that's training that's imposition of someone who thinks they know better upon your livelihood and upon your education it should be a human right that humans should have the right to decide what's going on in their own education. Villages should also have that right. It doesn't mean that they're going to go off and start a revolution because we want to study A, B, or C, and too bad for all of you. 
it uh, it also can be done in a way that's coordinated between and within communities so that it's harmonious but it does not at all mean that people should just sit there and take whatever some person in a big city says is the best for them right and that continues in university there's no education in universities it's all multiple choice tests up to a certain point and so i'm those are extreme uh, statements of course there's education here or there but for the large part our education system is a training system in, your TED Talk summarizes it very well. I felt useless. Well, that's why, because it's not really education. Education yeah. is a growing and thriving community. So, yeah, no, that is right. The words I get out of rant, right. and I have to curtail my what I say because uh, it, it it's hard to be patient with it after a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're one of the people that are calling out for one of the few now uh what are we doing a summer camp yeah uh, that's another thing i wanted to ask about uh so may and june is still open i'm not sure about who are the audience um and how can we invite them and where it should be are we still doing factor e farm for example if we and do that how many what are the, what's the minimum viable summer camp at Factory Farm? How many and what cost structure? And what can we tell the students? May and June, you're saying? Yeah, well, yeah, of course, uh, I think we already talked that June's kind of preferable because May is kind of moving from mud to greenery. So yeah. the, uh, maybe June is, okay. been, as you mentioned. And July is too late? Uh, July is already pretty much booked up with a Guyanese OSE camp at... <laughs> London International Academy. Uh, okay. So uh, that's very nice and exciting. But uh, early July could still work. So, yeah, that's when it's nice and starts to get nice and hot here. I would need help to set up Hab Lab. So we're getting that. We're delayed here on the internet line. I was supposed to be on a one gig line by now. But wow. because of the weather, that's not happening. And I don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, right now, probably like, I would say like two weeks, hopefully. <laughs> But okay, um, could be as I mean, with, if it doesn't warm up, they'll never be able to pour, put it in here. But yeah, so I mean, I would need some help here on cleaning up the place and getting it ready. Like, you think you and you and Charlie could come down before that? I think that would be great, and we'd love to do that. And we've already, like, I'm, I'm still keeping May and June open for that kind of stuff. And so we could potentially come down for a few weeks and uh, help out with setting up stuff like that. Yeah, like if we if we want to do it, like my my reservation on that is you know I'm I'm taking my sabbatical so called and and um, right working on book. the book and stuff. But it's actually primarily at this point it's still the business development part because without that I can't talk about anything in a book because I all I can say is that yeah open source is still a nice idea. <laughs> But I think we gotta yeah. we gotta get to the revenue models. So, uh, but a week like a week to basically make sure the have labs in order, things are cleaned up, like mm -hmm. mow the lawn and and set up uh, like we just pour the floor into have lab. We might want to do some of some of the outside rooms. They they need some finishing, like like wall, because uh, we we put in some hydronics under the floor in the whole building, and actually in the walls. Yeah. So we need to actually uh, do the walls like do the walls uh, but yeah get the internet up get the walls clean up the place make it shiny mm. so that's that's what we would need to so do here and clean up the place make it presentable hmm? i think that would be an excellent first step just like the ose contest step one is getting the printer well step one for ose stem camps is getting the camp habitat <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> No, that's true. As we're so, not going to be marketing on, on 2011 FEF. <laughs> those are the pictures I have. Right. <laughs> we'll, we'll save those marketing pictures for, for the his, historical analysis of the project. <laughs> yes. And for a few laughs. Yeah. Oh. No, that's good. Yeah, so... The chair outside was a very beautiful throne for you. <laughs> yeah. So... So, um, um, as far as the curriculum on that, yeah, I mean, around like July or sorry, say June, 
One, eight, fifteen, twenty-two, twenty, like twenty-nine. A particular week in June. Twenty-nine. That's also June good. twenty-nine. Actually, June twenty-nine. Yeah. Through that week. Nice and. Pardon? For a week from the 29th? Yeah. Okay. So the later, the better, right? Cause, yeah. Um, it gives us time to prepare because I think a good curriculum would be to to do the 3D printer, like start making film and formulas and big printer. Nice. Um, nice. And so will we recruit prior to that and have people ready to come up to a camp at that point? Or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we wanna we'd wanna do it as a week of week of immersion experience, and yeah. So yeah. what we're looking at is two weeks: one week to prepare, yeah, and one week to get going. And I would say not back to back. I would say like early June, get the place ready, make sure. Ah, now I see. And then July, what you're talking about, say, first week of July is the camp. Yeah. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Now I see. And we can come prepare, like, whenever, after May 15, any time. That's going to be nice weather. Good. So we could do June 1st yeah. or even May 15th. We'll come down. Yeah, and maybe uh, once it's May fifteenth, that's a good time for us. And then next, uh, come back ready to do a camp. Yeah, so we got like six yeah, weeks from the time of, you uh, arrive. After your brief, brief sojourn since twenty eleven, and then yeah. we got six weeks, and then we yeah. go to camp. So okay, that sounds very really reasonable. Yeah, so I would say like, I mean, roughly it's like you got filament, you've got big printer. I would I would look into doing the DIY the extruder from scratch using our CNC mill to actually mill it. You know, that would be Stuff amazing. Like actually, we're doing work on that. I forgot to even mention I have one group that's building the extruder right now. Yeah, they went to print a. Our print of the hopper, and I suggested oh, let's just make the hopper out of fiberboard to get it started. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Nice. they're printing off of it as we speak today. Like, I have one of the pieces freshly printed right now, so yeah, nice. that's another area. Where I was talking about the advanced 3D printer extruder, not the film and making extruder. Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, both are being done, both, <laughs> both. we want to do both, but um. Uh, so the thing about one thing I learned is it does not appear like there's any three millimeter optimized rubber extruder. Now the Titan Arrow claims to be that, but upon further analysis, don't like it. It's it's not it's not optimized for rubber. It still has a long neck, mm -hmm. and I would and like to eliminate that for the rubber. I mean, it's a interesting. Con con it's a confined neck, but it's still a long neck. And I looked at this other one called uh, Flexion, Flexion Extruder. Yeah, the design has to be such where literally like the drive wheel is like right next to the metal piece where it, which goes to the, to the heater block. Like it has to be right there. So the Titan is the closest, but I don't think we're going to print our tractor rubber tires with a Titan Arrow. I don't think it will do mm. it. Um, we need one that's optimized and also if we want to scale like if we're making our own filament and make it wider like even four millimeter five millimeter filament because uh, you know, we're going to need a lot of rubber for a tire right those are big things uh, oh yeah that's uh, that's where my friend at the factory was very interested in developing stuff like that absolutely for see printing very large yeah. things and we're yeah. talking about the two extruder solution yep. for the bulk you put down wide and then for the fine detail, you can still go back to a smaller, even a three or a one millimeter. Or oh, one interesting, one. interesting. Yeah, so really... it's a two extruder, but not for color, but for uh, grade or for size. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So the one by one can easily do that. Huh, interesting. Yeah, you'd need special firmware for that. But man, that would be excellent that you do the bulk print and the fat stuff and do the edges, like if you need detail. A lot of things like tires, of course, you're not going to need that much detail. 
Um, but we do have two color printers already out there, like two yeah. extruder printers. Yep. We just set settings for how far apart they are. Yep. And then set each uh, extruder motor with the right parameters. Yeah, and there's a lot of innovation to be made. Like you can make one that's got the two strings feeding into one. Because think about it. Yes. At that point, you can do continuous mixing. Like for example, nylon reinforced rubber. Nice. The, the software would well, be amazing. simpler, cool. I guess. Yeah. Um, but so lots, think of, lots of things. To do. Yeah, lots of things to do. So we need we need to develop the capacity. We need to build the teams in different schools to be able to do this. To do this basic R and D. Because this is not rocket science, any of this. This is once you, once you have open knowledge, then a lot of people can participate in this process. So this is where the design guides come in. So right now we live in an age where everyone is telling STEM education, STEM this, STEM that. But it's all parallel play, like two little children who just play beside each other. But when children grow up, they learn to cooperate. And this is what we're proposing. We're doing STEM education. One of the prerequisites should be that we're doing it meaningfully within a global framework of development that stands to eliminate artificial scarcity, for example. So it's, a, it's very meaningful to bring the OSE framework into an educational context, and it, it seems to resonate very well. When you speak about this with people, they're very excited about it. Nice. Love so, hearing that. That's, I mean, I believe in that. And I think that's a message that can that can spread. Yep. So uh, that's really great. Well, thank you very much. It's been a really uh, exciting time to collaborate. A lot of momentum seems to be potentially uh, underway. Uh, Indeed. So uh, we'll be in touch soon. I'll keep you updated on many lines of action that are related to this conversation. Yeah. And uh, we'll aim for sometime in May like maybe May 15th for an initial visit, yep. followed by hopefully in camp at around the first week of July. Yeah, that and, sounds uh, good. That'll be great. It'd be great to have you guys here. <laughs> Charlie. Hopefully. Oh, yeah, really exciting. And I uh, hope we can, yeah, we'll share the details as always uh, with some further emails. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You mentioned some guy who wanted a, a kind of like a gap year experience. I don't know if he's still interested. I didn't get to follow that up. There's so much going on when you sent that email. Uh, some guy from France or something. Yeah. If you're still interested in that, yeah, I mean, follow up with him. He might be a, a good candidate. Because just today, we've been uh, but it's entitled Gap Year at London International Academy. Oh, so interesting. Why not put those two pieces together and see what happens? Gap Year as in accepting other students from different places? Yeah. The thing is, uh, education, in quotes, which we already <laughs> talked about is not really education, it locks down people's energies with pre-canned uh, kind of programs. Like you go to university, you're not there developing your mind. You're like just struggling to survive the barrage of all the stuff they're sending your way. That's not education. That's just I don't know what it is. And so the only way that you can get around that is say, Someone who doesn't have a scheduled time, so they have the time to think deeply, that's someone who has a gap year. They don't have grade 12, and they don't have first year university, but they're at the perfect age for exploring such things, a gap year. So we have a curriculum for them, but it's not imposed, and it's developed in collaboration with the very participants for which it's designed. Oh, no kidding. So, so who's, running, no kidding. who's running that program? Well, we haven't actually run it by our school yet. But we would like to, it would be interesting to have a case in point where we can already show demand for such a program. And we are, we have a document that we, which is outlining the proposal. It's a perfect idea because we need more people to help in our STEM program, but we're not finding that trained teachers are meeting the requirements of education. They are only meeting the requirements of training. <laughs> so, wow. Wow. Yeah. So, like, it's really hard yeah. to consider how to hire teachers for a STEM program because. Your university education training really takes it out of you. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, so do follow up with that. So, so I, I assume this is something that you're spearheading or some collaborators with you in London I, at LIA. Yeah. To design and implement next year's program. Uh, so, uh, of course, it includes a lot more OSE written right into the DNA next year's program than last year even did. 
And then, well, that's one of the things having a gap year student or several, that's just more hands on deck to explore the limits of what can be achieved with open hardware technology. <laughs> <laughs> so th did you uh, come up with this proposal or was that you or somebody else? Pardon? Was that you that proposed the gap year? Well, gap year, I've heard the word gap year from my friend Johan. I've heard it from you and my friend Sarah came up with it. So it's floating around there. And I know several students who are on a gap year right now. So it's all around. Like some people call it a year of service and they'll actually go do community service for a year. Others are not sure what they want to study. And we're thinking a little bit of both. They would be in a service capacity helping yeah. high school students, mm -hmm. but in the process, learning open source technologies yeah. and learning what they're really interested in, how they fit into a team and all yeah. of that. So it seems like a very natural thing to offer. Yeah. And well, they may have a modest, tuition, not like a full school tuition. They may pay a little bit. Uh, they may pay their room and board and get a very reasonable rate to be in the school. So I'm, uh, but they would render a huge and invaluable service as being part of our STEM program. And if they were very productive, they may be offered a position. Job absolutely somewhere. yeah so, reach out to the, the french guy um about okay. that see, see what he thinks wow that's awesome and of course once we get the osc campus perhaps where the yeah. osc stem camp is going to be the first step to that in some dedicated way yeah we're talking about okay let, with that fa the fast internet is going to be a game changer that means we can actually do work yeah. here you know get online work and the students will feel that yeah. Hey, we can build the hut. You were just missing the internet. Yes. <laughs> so we are, uh, well, anyway, the internet was better on this call than any other time. So we're making progress. It's Maybe it's anticipating the day of the high speed. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, William, thanks so well, much you have for a great day. talking. You too. Well, thank you so much. And okay. uh, so how to, we know we'll see uh, you very soon online. Thank you, William. Take care. Good job. Okay, bye.